Hey everyone. Today I wanted to share with you a segment of the online course that I created, Foundations in Anatomy and Body Science for Yoga Teachers. Now this is a 10 hour online course and it's the first segment that I do in the 30 hour segment that goes into our 200 hour yoga teacher training. And I wanted to take this information and put it online because I feel like a lot of people struggle with the anatomy portion in their yoga training and it can be helpful to go back and watch it over and over and really absorb the terminology and get comfortable with all the information because that's how we start to build on that foundation and create a really solid understanding of our body and how it interacts with this practice of yoga. So I hope you find this segment to be helpful and I'll put a link in the description below if you want to check out the full course. In the final section of learning the language of anatomy and the terms of movement, we're going to talk about some basic biomechanics in terms of balance because one of the really wonderful things about yoga as a movement system is that we work on balance a lot. And I think that's something that other movement systems really kind of skip over or don't do justice to. We are really good at working on balance in yoga. So let's talk about what goes into this topic. So the term that you're going to hear most of the time is the center of gravity. And sometimes there's another term called center of mass, slightly different, but for the purposes of what we're doing right now, we're just going to call it center of gravity. And you can see over here, the center of gravity is determined by the distribution of our body mass. So, um, you know, some people are bigger on top or bigger on bottom. That is going to affect your center of gravity slightly. But overall, when you're standing upright in anatomical position with your arms and legs at center line, your center of gravity is going to be a few inches behind your belly button, maybe up or down below it slightly, but that's the general area. And you can see the plumb line that goes through the center of the body, lines up through the center of the ear, right around the shoulder, just behind the hip, right through the knee, and just in front of the ankle. But the center of gravity is directly on that line. Now, when your head starts to shift forward or you get to some sort of postural changes, that will change where your center of gravity is slightly. If we lift our arms up overhead, that changes the way that my mass is distributed around the center of my body. So again, the center of gravity is going to change. In yoga, we have our body doing all sorts of different things and we're moving from one to the next. So our center of gravity is changing position a lot. And that's why some of the transitions that we do in yoga are really challenging, especially in terms of our balance. Now, one of the things that we've talked about a little bit is the general differences between like male and female anatomy. And in general, the female center of gravity is going to be 55% of your standing height. And the male center of gravity is going to be 57% of their height, so a little bit higher. Um, of course, that's a generality, but we know uh, male and female mass distribution can be a little bit different, and that's really what's going to impact that difference. So let's look at some examples in terms of yoga. In anatomical position, it's roughly two inches below the belly button and two to three inches deep toward the spine. So in neutral standing, slightly below and behind the belly button. So I think that's pretty close to the pelvis and the pelvis is like the center axis of movement for most parts of the body with the spine going up from there. So the center of gravity is really right in the mix of all those important structures in terms of body movement. But then we start doing things like moving our arms and moving our legs, and then the center of gravity starts to shift. Here she's going into a forward fold, and this is a good example of how the center of gravity is sometimes outside of our body. But you can see that plumb line here showing where gravity is pulling straight down, and it 
puts the center of gravity over the feet still, but kind of toward the toes. So this would be when you're in a forward bend, you would feel your weight more in your toes than in your heels, and that's okay. It's just showing you that your center of gravity is farther forward. Then here, something like tree pose, you can see that the lift of the arms raises the center of gravity slightly, and the kicking out of the leg here is going to shift it over toward the side slightly. Here you come into triangle pose and it's really moved over toward that side there, toward the um, waist and the side of the hip. So it really depends on the way that the arms and the legs are arranged around the center of the body. So the second term that we're going to talk about that you're going to hear come up a lot later on when we start talking about poses is your base of support. And these are the structures that are creating support against your mat or against the floor or against a wall, whatever it is that you are using to support your weight. We can have a wide base of support or a narrow base of support and any variation in between there. We can have a single point of contact. Think like one-handed handstand or two points of contact, maybe a two-handed handstand or standing on two feet or three to four points of contact. So um, four points of contact would be table, hands and knees, downward facing dog, hands and feet. Three points of contact would be um, maybe a side plank with two feet in front of each other and then one arm on the mat and one arm up in the air, so three points of contact. Now, the examples that I like to use for base of support are just starting in mountain pose. Depending on the lineage that you follow, sometimes mountain pose is taught with the feet touching each other directly against each other, and that would be a narrow base of support. The feet are really close together. I tend to do hip distance apart, so some space in between the feet where the feet are more planted underneath the hip joints, and that would be a slightly wider base of support. We could go wider than the hips. We could go all the way out into this really wide stance. That is going to create a wider base of support. So I like to look at these pictures here where they draw a little dotted line around your points of contact with the floor. In this one here, it would be like a very, well, a very narrow stance down or, or a short stance down or facing dog, hands and the fronts of the feet. That little plus sign is usually there to represent your center of gravity. So your center of gravity in downward facing dog is planted right in the middle of a rather large area. So think about how you feel in downward facing dog. You're pretty stable. There's maybe sensation going on in the body in terms of stretching and opening, but you're stable. You don't feel like you're gonna wobble and fall over. Now trade that for, this would be like a narrow warrior one stance where your front foot and your back foot are more lined up. And that is a pose where if you turn your head or get distracted, you might start to wobble and feel like you're going to fall over. And that's because look at your center of gravity there. It has this very narrow track that it has to stay over the base of support. If it deviates slightly toward the side and it goes outside of your base of support, that's when you lose your balance. So let's look at some different examples here of how we can kind of work with the base of support. But this is one of the best-selling anatomy books, Yoga Anatomy by Leslie Kamenoff. He's a great anatomy teacher if you ever get to listen to his lectures or do a workshop, amazing. But this book I really like because he went through the process of taking a sheet of plexiglass and suspending it up in the air and then having the model perform the pose on that plexiglass so that he could literally have the photographer go underneath and take a picture of what the underside of the body looks like in any given pose. Because we spend so much time thinking about our contact with the mat or our contact with 
the supporting structures that we're working on, we actually get these beautiful visuals of what the pose looks like from underneath. And I love this little phrase that says, what the earth sees, <laughs> that contact of the feet. All right, so here's a little bit more about that relationship between your center of gravity and your base of support and how they're dynamic. They're always changing as the body is moving. We start in the middle here in almost anatomical position. The shoulders are a little abducted and the forearms are not supinated, but pretty close. So there's our center of gravity. That's what the base of support looks like and we're planted right in the middle of it, very stable. Okay, right in the middle. Now, when you go into a forward fold, that first one there, um, the hands are going down toward the mat and the center of gravity is now outside that base of support so the person has put their hands down. That's like if you've ever gone into a forward fold and felt like you were going to fall forward, it's because your base of support went past your feet and then here's the opposite, so back bending. The same sort of thing can happen. If you back bend a little too far, you're going to like stumble backwards because your center of gravity left your base of support. So you had to move and take a step to bring your base of support under your center of gravity before you hit the floor. And then you can see over here in a side bend, as the body moves over to the side, that center of gravity shifts toward that foot and you'll feel that difference in the weight shifting in your body. When you're re reaching across and leaning over, you'll feel more weight shift into that outer foot. So pay attention to that. Pay attention to what you feel in your feet when your upper body is moving and changing positions because that's going to tell you a lot about what's happening with your center of gravity. So how does this actually impact what we're doing with our students, especially because balance is hard. I always say it's like the hardest thing that we work on in yoga because it's such a, a complex skill. So I love these pictures because it's so good at illustrating what's happening here. There's our center of gravity. There's the gravity line, that straight pull down. He's making this extra challenging because he's on the toes. He's doing a little bit of plantar flexion there with the ankle. Um, but you have this nice 90 degree angle at the hip and a very straight line through the spine. So gravity is pulling down this way, which means the muscles in the back are working hard to keep the body like that. And he's really playing around with his gravity, his center of gravity and his balance. When the arms are back, Look where the center of gravity is. I always look at like the line of his shorts here. It's very close. When he goes to reach overhead, that changes the way the arms are distributed around the body. We have more mass in that direction. So our center of gravity moves forward. So he's working extra, extra hard to keep his center of gravity over the feet. And you'll see what happens too here. There's a little bit more space here compared to here. And what happens is the hips have to move back slightly to counterbalance the arms going forward. That keeps the center of gravity over the base of support, barely. I mean, this is a challenge. He's like right at the line there for his toes. So if he went any farther forward, he would like do a face plant because the center of gravity would be too far forward. Where I see this play out the most often in our yoga poses is the standing poses like warrior one or our high lunge, where we can do this kind of lined up on a tightrope, which a lot of times was the classical alignment that I learned for these poses, where the heel of one foot was lined up with the arch of the other foot. It was kind of like this very straight line from the front leg to the back leg. That can be really hard to keep your balance because it's such a narrow track. So if you start to wobble one way or the other, you're gonna go over. The option for that is to just widen your front foot and your back foot. Here you can see he's more like hip distance apart. I would call that a wider base of support. Easier to keep your center of gravity over the top of that wider base of support. You have some leeway. You can like rock side to side slightly and you won't fall over. I do the same thing in a low lunge. So think Anjaneyasana. 
you're in a low lunge, maybe you're doing some different variations with the arms, you're twisting, you're side bending. If the feet are really, really close together, you'll see your students kind of wobble a little bit as they go through transitions. So I'll say to them, if you feel really wobbly in your low lunge, take your front foot, wiggle it out toward the edge of your mat a few inches, and then feel how much more stable and grounded you feel. You just created a wider base of support, so it's easier for them to keep their center of gravity over that base of support. Then they have more freedom to explore movements with the arms without feeling like they're going to lose their balance because you have to be careful there. Sometimes students will get really frustrated with balance too, so giving them things that are helpful to manage that frustration can be really good. This is a video that shows the relationship between center of gravity and base of support beautifully in the art of rock balancing. So we can apply these terms to humans, but there are people who can actually do this with rocks. The way that they hold them, they can feel really precise movements of how to balance one on top of the other so that they stay without anything holding them up. It kind of looks like it defies the laws of gravity or physics, but it's actually completely aligned with physics in terms of using that distribution to create support. So some of the ways that you can kind of play around with this are here on the last slide. My favorite one is to sit all the way back into a chair. So your back is against the back of the chair and then try to stand up without leaning forward. So you're sitting up back against the back of the chair. Try to stand up. You can't. You're glued into the chair because your center of gravity is back over your hips. In order to stand up, we lean forward to move our center of gravity over our feet and then we straighten the legs to stand. So it's really fun to feel. You kind of don't think about that during the day. Your body will do that automatically for you. And it really drives that point home of where is my center of gravity? What part of my body is actually supporting me right now to create that base of support? So that's the super glue chair. The other one is the pickup trick where you try to stand with your legs and your back against the wall and then see if you can lean forward to pick something up off the floor without falling forward. You can't because the wall blocks your hips from moving back and counterbalancing you, just like that picture that we saw earlier. See how his hips are behind his feet? If there was a wall here, he wouldn't be able to do that. He would fall forward. And then the final one is a sideways movement. So if you stand with the side of your leg against a wall and then try to lift your outer leg up and over, you think like, oh, that should be easy. I should be able to do that. But again, you can't because the wall is blocking you from shifting your center of gravity to your standing leg to free the other leg. So really fun ways to play with these experiences of your center of gravity and your base of support.